Hey, what's going on, everybody? Thank you so much for joining this week's message here on our YouTube. And I want to invite you, make sure you like and subscribe this channel. Uh, it means the world to us, helps us grow, helps us reach more people. Comment below. And thank you to our Zoe family around the world, people that are part of our church, not just here in L.A., I also want to encourage you, get on a plane, a train, or an automobile. We have Zoe Conference kicking off this Thursday. Pastor Jensen Franklin, Pastor Earl McClellan, Rich Wilkerson Jr., Naomi Rain, and The Belonging Co. It wouldn't be the same without you. So get your face in the place this Thursday. We're at the Angelus Temple, Thursday night, Friday all day, and Saturday morning. We'd love to see you there. But let's jump into this week's message, The Story's Not Over. Job 42. Not only are we concluding the series today, but today is the last day of 21 days of prayer and fasting Shout out to everybody that's been fasting and praying. And I hope that tonight when the sun goes down, you break your fast, get you a cheeseburger, a piece of pizza, get you something that's not from Air One, get you something that tastes good, get the gluten up in that thing, get some sugar up in that thing. Just eat to your heart's content so you can feel disgusting tomorrow morning. Amen. But we've been fasting and praying for 21 days and really just preparing our hearts, preparing our lives for what God has this year. And we've been just seeking Jesus, asking him to speak to us and, and uh, really kind of, I call it, clearing out the cobwebs, clearing out the clutter so we can hear from God. And uh, thank you to every person that has been. Six in the morning, we've had over 200 people in the morning praying with us at 6 a.m. on Zoom and uh, praying with us on Wednesday nights. And I'm excited because I believe our church is a praying church. I appreciate you right there. <laughs> Westside, one person has faith here in our room. I'm sure there's tons more over there. Clap with this lady that began to clap because she gets it. She gets it. So it's a big day because we're not just ending a series, we're ending our fast. And uh, we've been studying the book of Job together. If you're new to our church or you missed, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to the other uh, messages. But we've been studying, we've been inspired by this man's faith named Job. We've been learning about the character and the nature of God. And Job was a wealthy man from the land of Uz. I glowingly refer to his land of Lil Uzi. And he had wealth and cattle and kids. And in one day, without warning, he loses everything. And in fact, he loses even his health. And the Bible says on his worst day, he says even to his wife, are we only allowed to accept the good days from God? Can we not, in addition, accept the bad days? He says, I want to let you know, I came into this world with nothing and I'm going out of this world with nothing. But as for me, blessed be the name of the Lord. In other words, what he's saying is, all I got on this earth is God. In fact, there's an old saying that says, he who dies with the most toys still dies. You're taking nothing with you to heaven. All I got is my faith. And if I got my faith in Jesus, I'm good. I love this because we learn so much out of the life of Job. And we're going to study, we're going to learn uh, just a few things to take from this study together. In fact, we're going to read the last chapter, Job chapter 42. Watch the conclusion. God has been listening to Job's rebuttal. And Job for a few chapters keeps complaining to God. How could you? Why did you do this? I'm innocent. See, the, the life of Job reminds us that we all ask that question, why do bad things happen to good people? Because if I'm good and I go to church and I'm in a connect group and I'm going Thursday night, if I'm in church, why do bad things happen? The reality is we don't have the exact answer, but we do know that whether good things happen or bad things happen, God is still faithful and I can be in return faithful to God. We learned this 
in this study. But nevertheless, Job's upset with God and, he, and, he, and he's talking back to God. And, and in fact, right before this chapter, God has listened to Job for quite some time, complain and bellyache and whine. And so God speaks back to Job and he says, okay, now it's my turn. And he says to Job, brace yourself like a man. I just want to tell you, if you ever get a word from God and God says, brace yourself, you better buckle up, sweetheart. <laughs> Out of all the things God has ever spoken to me, I never got to brace yourself. And God says to Job, brace yourself. He says, let me ask you a question, Job. When was the last time you told the sun to get up in the morning? Let me ask you a question, Job. Were you there when I set the foundations of the earth? And God starts to speak to Job and says, Job, you, 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 need, you need to pump your brakes a bit, buddy, pal. Watch what he says here, Job 42. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. Come on, anybody at Zoe know that God can do all things today? I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely, watch Job, surely I spoke of things that I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. So I'm believing that in 2024, you're going to go from hearing about God to actually seeing God. My parents used to tell me about God's goodness. Now I can see God's goodness. I had someone, go, when I was in youth group, someone told me about the things of God, but now I can see his plans and his purposes and his promises unfold in my life. Come on, clap and praise him and thank. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes can see you. Anybody want to see God? And Job could see God at work in his life. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes can see you. Verse 6, therefore I despise myself, and I repent in dust and ashes, the servant Job has. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he spoke to his friends, Elipaz the Timonite. I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. I just want to pause right there and just let you know that when you're talking to your friends and your family about God, do your best not to misrepresent him. Because some of us are telling people out here on these social media streets things about God that's not true. If it's not in the Bible, don't share it. I don't have my own truth. I only have his truth. And so I'm just a messenger and an ambassador of what God's word says, not my own opinion. Come on, clap today, West Side with us. Don't misrepresent God. He said, I'm angry with you, Ilya Paz. Just the, name of, just the name itself offends me. I'm angry with you and your little two buddies. Your little two. I'm going to keep it to myself. Because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourself. And my servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Timonite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite did what the Lord told them and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. And they comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. Isn't it amazing when you got no money, you ain't got no friends? But, it, but you, you and your own Uber, little Uber X, just pouting around L.A. But when you buy a Tesla, ball out, all your friends want to ride to. When he, when he had boils, he didn't have friends. But now he got his house back. All of his friends, all his brothers and sisters are there. And each one of them gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. Verse 12, then the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part of Job's life. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 donkeys. I want to preach a message today. Write down the title, Your Story's Not Over. Yeah, come on. Let's clap today if you believe that for your life. Your story is not over. 
In fact, I want to petition to you that the Bible says Jesus is the author and the finisher of your life. That God's just getting started with you. In fact, that last chapter, it might have had some bumps and some bruises and some characters that need to go. But I want to tell you that God's got a plan for your life. I'm telling you, you better buckle up and get ready because God is scheming for you. He is planning for you. He has prepared a way for you. He's already in your future. Come on, he's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. And your story's not It's not over. It's not over. It's not over. It's not, God's not done. You got breath in your lungs. It's not over. Come on, you got up this morning. It's not over. If you got up, you got a chance. And so what's God cooking up on your behalf? 2024, holler at your church. In fact, I want to invite you tonight. I know a lot of you are, are, are parents or, or business owners. You got to get up tomorrow morning early. But every year at the end of 21 days of prayer and fasting, we do what's called an anointing night. And tonight there'll be a prayer team here after um, I preach for a brief time. We'll anoint every person with oil and commission you out into your year. And you know what we're saying to you? We don't know what's about to happen but we're believing that God's angel army is on your side. Come on, West Side, clap with us right now. Come on, we're getting faith. Come on, clap if you got faith. This is going to be the best year of your life. Be careful. Be careful. Set your expectations appropriately. Because if you expect bad things, you probably get bad things. But if you expect good things from God, God will show up in a powerful way. Somebody say amen. And so, and so, your story's not over, and Job is proof of it. Job's proof. Job's sitting there in his ashes, and he's got boils from head to toe, and he's scraping himself. And, he, and, and if that ain't bad enough, he got three knucklehead friends that are telling him. Job's like, I'm innocent. I didn't do nothing. I promise you, I, I ain't been to Vegas since I played in AAU when I was in middle school. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I promise you, I'm, I love the Lakers. I'm a man of God. And Bill, Dad, and the boys going, no, you, you did something. Because God is so just, how could you be innocent and face hardship? <laughs> you telling me that you didn't do anything and something bad happened to you? That doesn't make sense. Just, just a heads up. This is the mysteries of the kingdom of God. We don't understand. In fact, in the story, we never understand. But we do conclude that what the enemy intended for harm, God can turn it around and use it for the good. I just want to give you four things today to draw from the life and the story of Job. Write down number one. We learn patience, perseverance, and the importance of holding your tongue. I just like this story because it, it requires Job, it was demanded that he was patient with God. You ever go through a hard season or a slump or you start suffering and you just want it to end? Like you just want to get out of the bad season and back into the good season so bad. And you kind of keep on telling God, like God, when, when was this, can, I, can, we, can we, this is enough. And the Bible says a day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. So God's on his own time wave. He's on his own time length. And God knows when he wants to bring you out of suffering and back into prosperity. And the reason why probably God hasn't brought you out of that thing is what is being produced in you is better. You're getting stronger. You're getting more dependent on God. You're getting wiser. You're getting softer. You're learning compassion. You're understanding mercy. You're developing empathy. You're having generosity. All this happens in suffering. And so we learn from Job patience and we learn from Job perseverance. He's persevering. What, what does Job teach us? That old saying, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. 
And Job is one day at a time, one foot in front of the other. It hurts like hell. I look like hell. I want to yell and scream, but I am going to praise God and I'm going to choose God and I'm going to persevere. I just want to encourage you in 2024, you have need of endurance. Endure through the struggle. Endure through the pain. Don't quit. It's not that cheaters don't prosper. Quitters do not prosper. You'll never get to where God's called you to go until you keep on learning the ability to not quit. Keep on showing up and keep on persevering. But we don't just learn patience and we don't just learn perseverance. We also learn to hold our tongue, the value of holding our tongue. And in, in, in the Bible speaks about how powerful your tongue is. In fact, James in the Bible says how little member of our body the tongue is and yet what a big forest fire it could cause. He says the tongue is this little member of our body and yet, and yet, it's like a rudder of a ship. It controls the destiny of our life. I want to encourage you this year to close your mouth when it's not appropriate to speak. If you ain't got nothing nice to say, don't say nothing at all. And here's Job. Job's one minute praising God and the other minute, what in the world? Why did you? And, and, and he keeps on mouthing off to God. And that's when God says, he shows up. He says, brace yourself. You've been talking all this nonsense. Now it's my turn to talk. It reminds me of a scripture in Ecclesiastes. Watch this, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Listen to Solomon's wisdom. He says, do not be rash with your mouth and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Instead of coming to God and just telling him everything he needs to change and what he needs to do and what's wrong, how about just going, God, you are so big and you are so strong and I don't have words to describe all my emotions, so I'm going to let my words be few. Because there's another proverb that says, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. So I got to figure out how to be patient, how to persevere, and not how to say anything that I shouldn't be saying even before God. Watch what God says in Job, Job 40, verse 6. It says, then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Will you discredit my justice and condemn my, them just to prove you are right? Are you as strong as God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? God starts talking back to Job and says, man, you're speaking about things you don't know about. And one of the things I've learned about God is that God is bigger and God is better and God is sovereign and God is so high above anything I can comprehend. So instead of telling God what he should be doing, I'm just going to trust that he is doing it. Instead of telling God what's wrong, I'm going to just trust him. He's going to make it right. Instead of telling God how mad I am, I'm going to just thank him for how much I got and how much he's been good and how much he's been faithful. So what we learned from Job is patience. And perseverance, but sometimes we need to let our words be few. I think God knows what he's doing. How about you? You know, the Bible says when you come to prayer that you're never informing God of anything. He already knows what you need. You've never come to prayer and prayed and God said, wait, what happened? Say that again. Run that back. I just want to get it right. You're telling me what? Now he's got the whole world in his hands. And Job proves to me, oh, I don't have to let God know. I just need to trust him. I just need to follow him. I just need to serve him. Amen. Second thing we learned from the life of Job, right down number two, is that God can restore you better than before. And a lot of us need to understand this because we're, some of us, we're, we're trying to get back the glory days, the old days. The old you, trying to get back there. No, when God restores things, he restores them better to what, than what they used to be. And God can restore you better than to where you used to be. He is a God of restoration. He specializes in broken things. We call God the master of disaster. And when you're in a Job-like scenario and situation, and it might feel like everything's broken. Just watch God 
redeem and restore and revive that which is broken. Come on, clap if you're thankful that he has that kind of power. Chapter 42, 10, and the Lord restored Job's, Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Double for your trouble. I just love that. Look at what the prophet Isaiah said. Instead, verse 7, 61, instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. And instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double Everlasting joy shall be theirs. I, I, I believe it. You're going through trouble. We serve the God that can give you double for your trouble. Now, Job wasn't patient and persevering and going through all this, going, guys, I know it's bad now, but watch, God's going to give me double. No, no. He was just faithful to God because he believed in God. But I want to let you know that God has the power to, if he so wishes, to give you double for what you've gone through. And that's what he does here with Job, is he said, I've seen you. And in fact, I just, let me just put it on the screen. Let me encourage you in what, whatever the enemy has taken away, God wants to restore. He wants to bring back to its former state, to bring back from a state of ruin, decay, disease, or the like. He wants to repair it. He wants to renew it. He wants to recover it. When I was growing up in church, when I was like in youth group, they used to sing this song. Um, they would say, we went down to the enemy's camp and we took back what he stole from me. And every time they'd sing, went to the enemy's camp and we took back what he stole from me. I was thinking, some of y'all shouldn't be going to the enemy's camp. I just, you're not strong enough for that. And, I, and they would sing it for like 30 minutes straight. Went to the enemy's camp, took back what he stole from me. I, I just never really liked that song. <laughs> you ever be in church, you're like, y'all y'all can like this one. I don't like this one. Because <laughs> I just felt like some, some, of you, some of you should stay away from the enemy's camp. It's what messed you up in the first place. Just let the enemy have what he took from you. <laughs> I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. Let me ask you a question. What has the devil stolen from you? Because the Bible calls him a thief. He's a thief. So what does, he, what does he steal? Your purity. What does he steal? Your joy. What does the enemy steal? Your identity. He steals your calling like he did Samson. He steals your confidence in Christ. He's a thief. In fact, John 10 says, the evil one comes to first steal and then kill and destroy. And when we talk about the God of restoration, he can, anything the devil stole from you, God can restore. And he doesn't just bring it back, back into its place and super glue it. And it's like, all right, here's your confidence back. And here's your friends back. And, and here's your calling again. And here's your purity. And, and it's back. No, he brings it back better. And Job proves to me that God doesn't bring me back to where I was. He takes me to a level that I never could have been there in the first place. I believe this with all my heart. God has a fast forward button. He can use it whenever he wants. Let me say it again for the people in the back, west side. God has a fast forward button. He can use it whenever he wants. He can take you from the depths of despair, from in the ruins of life, from being in total bondage, and he can take you to a place that you never deserved, you never imagined, you never prayed for, you never asked for, you never tithed for. Come on, clap, everybody, if you believe in the grace and the power of God. Come on, a louder praise today. God will restore you. We get in church and we sing resurrection power. What about restoration power? God can restore that broken heart, restore that broken life, restore that broken confidence. And all of a sudden you're dancing and shouting and you got your glow back and you got your go back all because of God. It's not by power. It's not by might. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. Joe proves to me, Joe proves to me that I could be in the depths of Joe was, he's got a friends accusing him and telling him what a terrible human he is. His wife ran off mad at him for staying in church. He's sitting there with boils. The boils are bad enough.
And God says, I'll restore double for everything you faced. I like that because, you know, when I go to salt and straw, I would never get a single scoop. <laughs> People that just go and get a scoop and like, I, I, we, we cannot be friends. <laughs> Why would you go to the ice cream shop that has the best ice cream in the world just get one scoop, one flavor? It is disgusting. You get a single scoop split in half, so it's one scoop, but it's split in half, you get two. God says, I'll give you double for your trouble. I know you've gone through hardship and pain, and I know, I know the enemy's stolen a lot from you. I know the enemy has stolen a lot from you, but I can go to the enemy's camp, and I can take back what he stole from you. You believe it? Yeah. Write down number three. I love this. This is so encouraging. How to remain faithful to God in spite of losing everything. I learned I learn from, from Job how to remain faithful to God in spite of losing everything. And it's so vivid, isn't it, the image? You get this picture of a wealthy man who has it all. Like in my mind, if you see Job, and Job's in the marketplace, Job's, you know, at a grocery store or something, like Job's just walking like, hey, everybody, how you doing? Yeah, I good to see you guys. Come by the house, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't think he's cocky or arrogant, but you ever see someone that has self-confidence, you're just like, dang. <laughs> like, you know what's going on. Like, give me some of that for my life. Like, Job had it all. And without warning, loses it all. And yet still, in his losing it all, remains faithful to God. And so I am inspired that Job in his worst day, still chose faith. And I could look at Job and go, I don't know if I am the measure of that man. Because for me, I, I need a few things for me to be happy in Jesus. I love Jesus, but if you took away coffee, I would not be here today. <laughs> See, I wonder, if, I was trying to say this last week, but like some of us have idols in our life. And we have things that are in front of God. That we want God plus a, plus a sweet deal. And Job inspires us, not because of what he had, but because of what he chose when he lost. And the fact that he lost so much at such a big degree and still worship, that inspires us. I just want to encourage you, 1 Samuel 12, watch what's required of you. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. That's all we need, Zoe. Only serve the Lord and serve him faithfully. In fact, I, I said it a, a couple weeks ago, but I'm praying that our church increases in our fear of God. That we just fear, we have a, an awe and a rever I'm telling you, at Zoe Conference, when we start this thing Thursday night, there's going to be an awe and a reverence of a holy God. And I want to just petition you very quickly to increase your holiness. You know, like holiness, yeah, yeah. God calls us to be holy because he is holy. And you might be like, I don't even know what holy is. The word holy means set apart. And God says, because I'm set apart and there's no God like me, I want my people to be set apart. So I don't live a life of mixture where it's like one foot in the, in the things of God and one foot in the world. No, I'm trying my best to live a holy life because my God is holy. And let me encourage you, holiness is an invitation into intimacy with God. That if you ever want to get intimate with our creator, you've got to come before a holy God with a holy reverence and a holy fear. Singing holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. How awesome and majestic and how wonderful are you, God? And those are the kind of people that God brings close to him. Those that, that understand how holy he is. And the only thing that allows us to approach his throne is the blood of Jesus that washes us as white as snow. And by Jesus, we are made righteous and we can come to God with confidence because of the purchased blood of Christ. And I see this and, and the Bible says, fear God 
and serve him faithfully. Look at this next scripture in Hebrews. Put up Hebrews chapter 4. Look, look, look at this unwavering commitment that we're, we're required of. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. He's faithful. You're going through a storm. Man, I can't wait for Naomi Rain to sing that song. <laughs> Thursday night. We, you know we're making her sing Jira and Wait on You. You know those two. This happened. She sings that famous line, going through a storm, but I won't back down. Because I'm not going to waver. Is he good? Is he not? Is he for me? Is, he a, is, it, is this right? Is this? Some of us, our biggest problem is you have two minds operating your life. The Bible calls it a double-minded person. Sunday, you're like, Jesus. And Monday, it's a whole different, it's a whole different you. I don't want to catch you on a 405. <laughs> and what's the Bible say? No, what's required of us is an unwavering commitment and faithfulness to God. Why would I choose to be faithful to God? Because I know he's faithful to me. So my faithfulness is a response to his faithfulness. It's kind of like when you give your tithes and your offerings. My giving is just a response to his giving in my life. And I learned from Job, oh man, this guy without a notice. It's like being on a call on a Zoom and you find out that a couple hundred people have been laid off from the place that you work at and just without warning you lose your job. Without warning someone dies. I'll never forget, and we're, we're honoring Kobe. I'll never forget, I got out of the first service, and I was in the back with a couple, and, and this guy looks at me and says, Kobe died. And I looked at the man, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I didn't know you guys have a dog named Kobe. <laughs> oh, my, my heart just was like, are you serious? And he was like, no, Kobe Bryant died. And I was like, ah, oh, no. no. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. No, no he didn't. He's like, look, Kobe died. You just, without warning, life happens. No one gives you a heads up. Heads up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bounce from your life. Hey, just a heads up, just want to, <laughs> I'm going to betray you. Get ready. Watch your back, going to stab you. <laughs> Nobody warns this. Nobody warns. But Job proves that I don't need a warning or a heads up to stay committed to my God. They already got my warning. This earth is fallen. Something, I don't know what could happen, but God will remain good and God will remain faithful. And I'll get up tomorrow and I'll have breath in my lungs. Come on, clap, Zoe. Come on, everybody. West Side, Miguel, come on. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Right down the last one, worship team, come join me. We learn, bless those who hurt you. Bless those who hurt you. And God talks to his friends, doesn't he? He says, Bill, Dad, Eliphaz, get over here, boys. He says, I'm mad at you because you misrepresented me. And you said a bunch of stuff about me that's not true. However, I'm going to forgive you. If you prepare an offering and you go to Job and you, and, you, and you bring it to Job, and if Job prays for you, then I'll forgive him. I'll forgive you. So they get the offering together and they come and they get the sacrifice and they come to Job and his friends ask for forgiveness. And they say, Job, you got to forgive us, please, man, please, please. We didn't mean it. We spoke out of turn. We said some crazy stuff. We were wrong. We were dead wrong. I just pray over your life that you have the maturity to forgive people that have hurt you. And even if they don't come asking for forgiveness, that you still give it to them. Because watch what it says in chapter 42, verse 10. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. After Job had prayed for his friends. After Job had prayed for his friends, then the Lord restored his fortunes. After the, after the prayer, after the forgiveness, after the reconciliation, after he let it go, then the Lord was able to restore. I wonder for you, 
if you're blocking the flow of the kingdom of God. God's going, I want to restore you. I want to give you double for your trouble. I want to bless you. But one thing about God, friends, hear me. He will never bless chaos. Another way to say that, he will never bless that which is not blessable. And so the Lord holds the restoration. He's got it ready. He's got it prepared. And it says, after Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortune. I think it's there for us, don't you? I think the scripture's for me and it's for you and it's it's to teach us, right? That the hardest part of all this is relationship. (laughs) Because if it was just about faith, we'd all be like, yeah, I can do that all day long. What? Choose God, serve God, praise God. Hallelujah. But um, are you asking me to forgive the one that hurt me? You're telling me to pray for the one that cursed me? Last scripture of the day, Jesus says it this way in Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. But I say, Jesus says, pray for them. Bless them. You can't carry all that hate. You can't carry all that bitterness, all that resentment, all that pain. So why don't you let it go? I'm just believing for us that our heart will be clean. Amen. What did Jesus say? He said, when you pray, you ought to pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give me my bread today, my daily bread. And Lord, will you just forgive me of my sins as I forgive those that have sinned against me? Why is Jesus teaching you to pray that way? Because some people are going to sin against you. And some people aren't going to do it right. Even if they're friends and they're trying their best. Even if they don't know what they're doing. Even if they don't realize the damage or the consequence or the bitterness that's landed in you. Forgive them. Forget it. Don't hold on to it. You're not strong enough to carry that stuff. Your story's not over, friend. But I'm telling you, your story's stuck until you forgive. Because some of us are like, man, 2024. Double from my trouble, master of disaster. About to ball out, baby. About to get in that anointing night, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And God's like, oh, let's come back. Wait, right. There's an issue here. There's an issue here. There's an issue here. There's an issue right here. And it's called relationship. After Job prayed for his friends, then the Lord restored his fortune. Some of us don't realize that what's holding you back and keeping you in your last chapter is this. Pray for him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. So be like, yeah, 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 but pastor, you don't know what they did. They weren't just like some bill dads that were saying things about God. I don't know what they did. I don't. I just know how the kingdom of God operates. It operates on receiving forgiveness and giving forgiveness. And I got to drink in his forgiveness today. How about you? I need my friend's sins to be forgiven. How about you? I need a whole bunch of grace in my life. How about you? So how are you going to receive it and not give it? The kingdom of God is not about getting. The kingdom of God is about giving. And the more you do, the more God will work with your life. Your story's not over. Father, I pray today.